Welcome to today's educational webinar on ransomware. What is it and how can I defend against it? My name is Jeff Clark, and on behalf of the ArcLight team, I have the privilege of serving as the program moderator for today's education. So welcome. Uh, another ArcLight team member joining us today is Ben Johns. He's a 20-year IT professional and account manager for ArcLight. During this 45-minute session, please feel free to submit your question to utilize in the Q&A uh, at the bottom of the screen, or it may be on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, at the end of their session, we'll also be you know, conducting a drawing for uh, our $25 gift card, so please stick around for that. Um, as you know, ransomware is considered the fastest growing malware hazard of the 21st century and continues to threaten our organizations. Today, we're going to learn key ransomware defense strategies that can be deployed to protect your organization. It is now my privilege to introduce uh, today's uh, presenter. Our speaker today is the CEO and lead engineer for the Arclight Group, a company he founded more than 13 years ago. Please welcome Brian Largent. Brian? Hey, Jeff. Thank you uh, for the introduction there. And uh, we've got the polls going right now. I'm going to go ahead and uh, let those run in the background. If you guys want to fill those out, I think there's going to be one more poll when this one's done, uh, and we'll go from there. So uh, thanks for coming. Um, hope you're going to enjoy what we're going to talk about today. You're going to learn a little bit about ransomware, uh, what it is, how you defend against it. And one of the, the key things about ransomware is also how do you recover from it when it happens? So so we're going to be touching on all those things. The first thing that you need to know when you're talking about ransomware is, is that it is a risk. Everyone go, has to judge and evaluate their risk. So let me get my slides to work. There we go. And um, so everyone has to judge and evaluate their risk. So, so how do you judge and evaluate your risk to ransomware? Well, it's, there's a lot of pieces that go into that. Uh, the first thing I would say is, do you have a computer and is it turned on? Because if you have a computer and it's turned on, you have a risk for ransomware, it's that simple. And if you ask IT companies, what's the number one fear that you have? It is that your customers are gonna get ransomware. So, so our customers should also be concerned about ransomware because IT companies, pros like ourselves, are constantly uh, worrying about the threat of ransomware and what it could do to our reputation and our customers if any of our clients get ransomware. So we, we try to protect our customers from that risk. But judging risk is a delicate balance. It's, it's really a, a dance of sorts. Uh, you've got a budget, you can only spend so much, and you need to protect your business the best you can. So what you have to do is you have to be educated enough that when people are presenting you with solutions, that you can pick the right solutions and not just the bright, shiny objects. Because IT guys love bright, shiny objects, and we love to sell bright, shiny objects. But we want to sell you stuff, at least Arclight does. We want to sell you stuff that's going to protect your environment. So let's talk about what ransomware is. So first of all, what ransomware is, it's an encryption. So first, you got to know what encryption is. Encryption, this is a, a really simple, what's called a number substitution cipher. You know, we've probably all done this on the back of a box of cereal when we were kids. Uh, may have just dated myself, but... Uh, but you'd have like uh, the, the secret decoder ring and uh, I think it's a Christmas story. The kid wants to get it and he's uh, figuring out and doing the substitution cipher on his ring to figure out what the mess secret message is. And I think it was drink more Ovaltine, if I remember right. So so what they do whenever a, a ransom, whenever encryption is used is it takes your data that's on your computers and it encrypts it. It makes it so that you cannot read it without a decryption key, just like that ring on a Christmas story. So when they do that, then you can't get your data. You've lost everything. Your operating system, the content on your operating system, everything has to be decrypted before you can actually use the computer. So, so that is ransomware, how it's used maliciously, but how it's used in a positive way is Microsoft has a encryption tool called BitLocker, and that's where you can encrypt your systems. And that way you can protect them from uh, theft or when someone does possibly steal your computer, they cannot get the data off of it. So how does that work? Because if you can't read it, if it's encrypted, how would BitLocker protect your data if you can't touch it? Well, it's encrypted, but it gets decrypted each time you log in uh, and it's encrypted in the background. So the encryption key is tied to your password and your encryption key is stored on your, usually it's in a, an area called the TPM, which is a, a little chip that's on your computer and it's usually stored there. Now, interesting fact we learned the other day was that Microsoft's Windows 11 is going to require a TPM chip so that they can encrypt every computer that they sell. I think it's brilliant. Uh, it is going to make a lot of uh, hardware obsolete for home users, but it's still brilliant. Uh, I think that, that it's going to be really good for security overall. 
So when you encrypt your own stuff using BitLocker to protect it, it, it still runs like it always did. It runs in an unencrypted state. But as soon as you log out of that computer, let's say it's a laptop and you leave it in your car, someone smashes your window and takes that laptop. Well, they got your laptop, but they don't have your data because they will not be able to decrypt anything encrypted with BitLocker. And that's the key there, especially when you're talking about healthcare, financial data, if you store banking information on your laptop, that's what's really important. Now, we encrypt every single one of our clients' computers that support it. If they don't support it, we do try to get them to replace those computers, and we've had a pretty good success at doing that. Uh, so, so that's encryption, how it's used both uh, legitimately to protect your, your data, as well as how it's used to, to, uh, to ransomware your systems as well. So going just a little further, so this is an example of a number substitution cipher. So the word encryption, if you substituted each number based on, oops, sorry, I keep clicking the wrong screen. There we go. That was the encryption one that I just skipped past. Uh, and then this is the number substitution cipher for the word encryption. So, so you have 514, 318, 25, so on. So each one of those letters is substituted for a number. And then you can use that to, um, to, to send a secret message to someone that they have to use that the number substitution cipher to decode it. All right. <clears throat> Attacker motives. Well, you know, we, we've thought for years that the people that wrote viruses and did things were living in their mom's basement and they were just kids, you know, trying to be malicious. Those days, I mean, well, those things probably still exist, but not like they used to. Um, I think a lot of kids have really lost the interest in doing that kind of thing. Uh, plus, I think it's a lot harder to get away with these days to, to just be a kid in a basement. Now it's it's organized crime for the most part. Uh, it's government actors. It's sanctioned. Um, and in some countries, it's it's a legitimate business where you actually put on a shirt and tie and go to work every day and run a company that does ransomware to attack other countries. And Russia specifically, this is very common. And they really one of the things that you'll find out is really interesting is when you when a ransomware comes, when you get hit with ransomware, the company that hits you actually feels like they're doing you a favor. They'll actually talk like that. They're saying, well, better us to, to have done this and allow you to buy out than someone else because you had vulnerabilities in your network. Um, they don't really have any shame about it. It's, it's a very hard way to go through life, but that's, that's sure the way they do it, and they make a lot of money doing so. So, so the attacker motives, they want to resell EPHI. EPHI is electronic protected health information. So if you're a medical practice, uh, you'd have EPHI, PII, PCI, uh, PCI being financial information. So let's say you have banking information on your computers. Uh, they would want to get that. If you store, like, for instance, a spreadsheet that uh, has a whole bunch of uh, uh, bank card information for employees and so on for direct deposit, they would want to get that and then be able to go after your employees and so on. Um, and then other data uh, to be able to resell it to, to a malicious buyer. So, so whenever they get into your systems, there's multiple things they want to do, not just ransom your computers. They want to exfiltrate data, which take data out of your system after they've infiltrated your system by getting into it. Then they want to use the data to launch additional attacks. One of the ways we see this go down is if your email gets compromised and someone can read your entire address book and everyone you've ever sent email to, they will download everything that you have in your email, say on Office 365, and they'll just literally work through that for weeks, months, years, however long it takes to find information so that they can then pretend to be you to attack other people. So they might send an email to uh, your bank saying to wire transfer money or to a different person within your company saying, um, you know, Susie's out of town. She needs you to get 12 gift cards and send them to so-and-so. You know, it's, it's uh, once they have that email, they can start to craft a, a narrative or a story or a, a brand around who you are that they then impersonate you to try to get other people to do things. Um, and then they want ransom payments, of course. If they encrypt your data, they want to get paid. So if, you, if they encrypt your data, they're going to say, I want X uh, billion or million, trillion dollars, whatever it might be. Uh, and then you have to negotiate with them. And if you think that's inexpensive to do, uh, think again, because it's not something you can even negotiate with them on. You have to bring in a third party company that's a forensics company. They bring in attorneys and you have to have this big rigmarole because the U.S. government and other governments really frown upon negotiating with criminals. And so you need to bring in a bunch of people and it costs a whole bunch of money. And then you have to negotiate the payment. Sometimes they'll negotiate. Recently, we heard of a ransom that was $4.2 million. It got negotiated down to just under $400,000. But the buyer, the, the people that were ransomed, was a hospital. And that hospital only bought back 45 of their servers. They allowed the others to, to just be wiped out and blown away because they were the ransomware company had encrypted each one of their servers and devices with a different key. So they were able to sell them back individual servers. 
brilliant. I mean, if, if, you, if you're looking at it from a, if I ransom someone, how do I optimize my value? And they did a very good job at it, uh, as much as I hate to say that. So, um, and then some of them won't negotiate with you. They're going to look at what is the total value of your company? They, they'll look up on Dun & Bradstreet and other websites to see, you know, how well is your company doing? How well is your hospital, your, your private business, so on? How well are you doing? And when they look that up, they're going to say, oh, well, they can afford X million dollars. And they're going to hold you ransom for that. They're going to know, for the most part, how well they've locked down your environment. And if they know that, then, hey, if you can't recover, they know the cost to recover from what they're doing. And they're going to try to price it accordingly. And so one company we saw got a ransom for $4.8 million. And lucky for them, although their backups were wiped out and the majority of their network was taken down, they did have another backup that they weren't even aware of that they were able to recover from, which is fantastic, great for them. But it was a fluke that they were able to survive without paying it because the people that did the ransomware would not negotiate. They wanted $4.8 million and that's all there was to it. To put that in perspective, they could have rebuilt their infrastructure many times over all their technology, all their computers for that price. All right. Um, uh, corporate or national uh, chorus payment got that. Uh, oh, chorus payment would be a threat to release data. So if they get into your system, they're going to use everything in their in their wheelhouse. So let's say they've encrypted your data and you say, well, we're not paying. Well, the next thing they're going to say, is, OK, we're going to release your data if you don't pay. And that's another way to force you to pay, even though you might be able to recover. So that's where they exfiltrate your data and take it out of the network. And then you've got corporate or national defense espionage. So that's where we talk about, um, um, you know, na nation state actors, uh, Russia, North Korea, people that want to do harm to the United States have realized that we're a hotbed of mis mis uh, uh, misconfigured and, and no security at a lot of companies. And, um, you know, we're, we're very, I hate to say it, we're very money driven in America. And sometimes that means that we cut corners on things we shouldn't cut corners on. And technology is a very complex uh, thing to really configure properly, and it has a lot of cost to do it right. There's no silver bullet or cheap way to do security right. There is uh, lesser expensive solutions that do work well, and you just need to know the industry. So you really need a trusted advisor on your technology to be able to determine what you should spend money on. Again, you don't want to get into the bright, shiny object where your IT company just wants to sell you everything under the sun, so, or, or your internal IT people for that matter. Uh, so damage a foreign nation. So there was a virus called the Stuxnet that was, um, it's pretty much well known at this point. I don't think it's ever come out and been proven uh, substantially, but that Israel and the United States worked together to create the Stuxnet virus, which was used to attack the Iranian uh, Siemens centrifuges. Siemens is a German company that made nuclear uh, equipment, or I don't know what you'd call it, but nuclear reactor equipment for uh, uh, power plants. And the Iranians were using it to enrich uranium, supposedly for their nuclear program. Well, the Stuxnet virus uh, directly attacked the Siemens system and uh, changed the speed at which the centrifuges spun, which ruined the ability for the Iranians to enrich uranium. It was a brilliant attack. But again, that's another example of how uh, you know, nations attack other nations through a cyber warfare. And then you've got malicious destruction of data. Just someone wants to do you harm. Uh, you know, foreign nation, the damage to a foreign nation is kind of the similar same thing, but you might have someone like uh, an employee who just is disgruntled and they went online and Googled where to get a virus or to get a something or whatever they can do. And they just attacked your whole network. And the way we see a lot of small business networks built where each employee is a local administrator on their computer, it's a very easy attack for an employee who's malicious with maybe just a little bit of knowledge or a brother or a cousin who's technically savvy to give them enough knowledge to go and launch an attack on the network and just walk away. I quit and walk away and destroy your whole network. It's very hard to track that back to the original attacker. And the reason that's hard, especially with ransomware, is because once your entire environment is encrypted, we have no logs to go on. It's, it's like going to a crime scene and uh, there's usually a chalk outline, there's a body, there's bullet casings, you've got detectives running around and they're marking everything, trying to recreate the scene. Well, when ransomware happens, nothing exists. You don't have anything to go on. Everything's lost. Uh, so, so anyone that does attack you, it's very, very difficult to track it back to them unless they sell you the ransomware keys so that you can buy it back out. So if you had an employee who wanted to be malicious and he kicked off a ransomware attack on your network and just walked away and didn't care about getting any kind of payment out of it, you'd be hard pressed to ever find out or prove it. All right. Um, so one of the examples I use when I do this presentation um, in uh, um, live is I have a little lockbox. 
And in that lockbox, uh, we'll put someone's phone in there and we'll say, okay, this is the same as having your computer ransomware. So your phone's in this box. I want you to randomly try the code to see if you can get your phone out. And we walk it around and let people go around and try to unlock the box to get their phone out. And usually someone will get it out because the code is usually one, two, three, four, five, okay. So it's super simple code. But what's funny is a lot of people don't get it. They try random numbers and so on. But usually someone is just kind of like, whatever, and they do it and they'll get the phone out. The reason we do this is to explain how a unsecured password, something that's super simple, anyone can get it, uh, especially an attacker with an intent to get it. They will try multiple passwords, they'll try different things. So in this example, we talk about just securing your environment against ransomware by using complex passwords, or what we really like to have people do is multi-factor authentication. So on this particular box, you can use a code and you can use a biometric scan to be able to keep someone from getting the device out. If you combine the two, getting it out is very, very difficult. So we do encourage people to do that. Uh, use a complex password and a second form of authentication, also called multi-factor authentication, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. All right, legitimate use of encryption. I already talked about Microsoft BitLocker. It's an AS128 bit or 256 bit encryption. Every computer that you have in your organization should have that turned on. It really costs you nothing as long as you're buying modern computers that have what's called a TPM chip in them. And again, if you don't have a TPM chip on your systems, you're not gonna be going to Windows 11 until you do. Uh, so Windows 11, it's a long story. I, Microsoft said that Windows 10 would be the last operating system they ever made, and now they've come up with Windows 11. So uh, go figure that Microsoft didn't uh, exactly say the truth. Not legitimate use of encryption, again, ransomware. And there's a lot of names for these. They always come up with these little uh, cheeky names for every virus or attack. And so you've got WannaCry, Petya, Not Petya, Locky. And they'll use hybrid AES-256 and RSA. And what they'll do with those is they'll, they'll encrypt their attack as well as encrypt um, the uh, data on your system. So you really have a hard time figuring out exactly what happened. Oops, sorry. Phone's over here buzzing on me. All right. All right, defense against the dark arts. Um, know thyself, know thy enemy, a thousand battles, a thousand victories. Well, the first thing you have to know is you have to know that your enemy is uh, the internet. Everyone on the internet is kind of your enemy. So you need to protect against that. There's, there's a balance between, uh, like I talked about before, there's like a dance between what you can afford to spend on security and what you need to have in security. And you have to understand your risk. And right now with ransomware, the risk is incredibly high. And we advise everyone that there is a minimum set of security that you need to have in your organization. Again, we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, but know your own internal vulnerabilities. There are some things that don't cost anything to secure your environment. And one of those is just setting complex passwords, like I mentioned before. There's, uh, there's policies like locking your screen. I'll give you a good example. One of the ways that ransomware gets on systems, uh, the most prevalent is through email. Someone will send an email with a link, an employee will click on the link, they link will immediately grant access to someone that someone will remotely remote into your systems and start trying to figure out ways to attack them, gathering passwords and other information. But one of the, the, the lesser known ways that people get into systems is just from websites, malicious websites. Now, most people think, well, if I go to a website that has a malicious payload, I'm just not going to click anything. I'm going to recognize it and so on. Well, that may be true, but you know who doesn't do that? Uh, your janitorial staff. <laughs> so, We've seen this uh, more times than I want to admit, where an organization doesn't have screen lock timers on their computers. So what that means is when the employees go home at the end of the day, everyone leaves their computer logged in, where they left off on their computer, and then the janitorial staff comes in in the evening. When the staff comes in, we've seen more often than not, they bring their kids with them, they're working until midnight or so, and the kids are sitting on employee computers playing video games or surfing the internet, and the next thing you know, your computer is covered with viruses and other issues. Again, these are just some basic things. Set a screen lock timer, use complex passwords, and that'll prevent people that are not authorized to get on your computer and cause damage. But it's things like that people don't think about. They don't think about the cleaning crew being there at the, in the evening. What they think is, I left my office, I turned my computer off, I locked my door, I'm good. What they don't think about is when someone comes in that has the key, unlocks the door, unless their kids sit at your computer and play, or even an employee go to your computer and play. Uh, we had a client many years ago who kept finding printouts of pornography on their copier every morning. 
And what they found out was one of the employees that was in the janitorial group was going and looking at pornography and then printing things out on the copier and it would get a jam. And so someone would fix the jam first thing in the morning and the next thing they know, they've got 20 pages of porn sitting on the copier. So uh, quite the experience. All right. The four evil pillars. So this is what attackers want to do. They want to infiltrate your system. They want to embed in your systems, which I'm going to explain embedding here in just a second. And they want to exfiltrate data out of your system. And then they want to hold you ransom. That, those things, those four things give them all the power in the world to be able to take your data and your organization and hold you ransom in multiple different ways. Now, let's talk about what embedding looks like. A lot of companies will think that uh, just because I have backups that if I get ransomware, I'm just going to recover from backups. Every ransomware incident that we've talked to the people who've been ransomed have lost their backups as well. And they lose their backups because the backups were encrypted or corrupted by the attacker because they were on the same network using the same authentication mechanism that was compromised by the attacker. So for that reason, you need to have backups on-site and off-site. And your off-site backups need to have a totally separate authentication mechanism that cannot become compromised unless that network is also compromised as a direct attack, not as a, uh, a sub-attack, like they hit the main network, they just traverse the network and they can touch your backups on another network. They need to be completely isolated and on a totally different network. Now we do that for all of our clients, but a lot of companies with internal IT, the IT staff will maybe you know, have an offsite backup, but it's the same network segment. You can see it, there's no, there's no detachment between the two whatsoever. And then the attacker, it's a very easy thing to jaunt over to your backups and corrupt those. And that's because, you know, IT guys are like, well, our network's secure to begin with, therefore I'm not that worried about it. So they, they kind of play it, play it the uh, safe, they think, but they're really not. They're, they're, take, they're playing loose and fast is what they're doing. All right, so let's say they don't get your backup. You have an offsite backup. Here's the other problem. There's a thing called dwell time. When attackers get in your network, they sit in your network for a certain amount of time. And they'll sit there and they will go and probe everywhere. They're going to install their virus. They're going to set it up in memory. They're going to do triggered events that cause the, the attack to trigger and, and happen again at a later date. They're going to do everything in their power to make it very hard for you to root them out of your network unless, unless they allow you to root them out of their network, right? By buying their ransomware key or whatever. So once they've embedded in your systems and they've been there this dwell time of, say, 45, 60, 70 days, your backups that are happening daily on your servers are also getting all that embedded stuff every day. It's backing up a different version with all the changes of everything that they've done to embed in your systems. Now, you have to, before you can recover, even if you've got good backups after they ransomware you, before you can recover, you have to root them out of your backups, which can be very time consuming, going through all your backups to find all the attack vectors to do all that. And then even if you do recover from backup, you're never gonna feel confident about any of your systems until you've completely wiped them reinstalled them and reconfigured uh, your entire environment. So once it does happen, it's, it's a mess to get them out, even if you have good backups. So again, personal gain is the, the in some way they're gaining something. It's some, it's some kind of selfish endeavor. They're gonna try to infiltrate, embed and exfiltrate and then hold ransom. So the four good pillars, these are the things that you can do to prevent um, ransomware or any kind of virus or attack that, you, that could possibly hit your network. So your people are number one, and this is often overlooked because technology guys like myself, we think, oh, we're gonna throw technology at it. We're just gonna keep putting more and more solutions in to protect the client. That's not the case. I mean, we do need to do some of those things, but your people are the first line of defense. If your employees are willing to go and open the door at the office with someone outside the door that's holding a gun, well, everyone in your office is probably gonna be in much, much danger. If your employees are willing to click on every single link that comes through email, well, your employees are in much, much danger. So your people need to be trained and they need to also be tested on their training. And what I mean by tested is we need to be sending or you need to be sending, uh, someone needs to be sending uh, phishing emails to your employees. And that way, if they fall for your fake phishing emails, you can see if they're actually taking the training that you've been sending. Now, there's two ways to handle that. There's the carrot or the stick, right? Your, if your employees mess up, you can go yell at them, put them on a wall of shame or what have you. But we don't really like that much. We like the, the wall of fame. And that's where you actually have, the employees have the ability to catch the phishing emails. We have, a, we have an app called Catch Fish that runs in the browser toolbar for our clients. When the, the client sees a email they think is phishing, they can click the Catch Fish button. It's going to analyze it, let them know if they think it's a fake or real phishing email. If it's a, a fake phishing email that we sent, 
uh, then they get points for that. And at the end of the month, you can give the employee like a $5 Starbucks gift, gift card who catches the most fish. Make it fun, not punitive. People will learn. Uh, it's a great way to get your people on board with uh, with everything. And it, and the thing is, is what we've heard is, well, I just put click catch fish on every email that comes in. Good. That's fantastic. I think that's great. That's that's your employees. Maybe it takes a little more time, but now they're catching all the fish that are coming in. And each time they catch them, they're like, OK, why did why was that one like that? And it explains it to them. It's a really good system. And then you've got process. That's just your process for your business, how you communicate with uh, each other internally. Um, for instance, we went into a hospital recently where the employees had their <laughs> computers were mapped to each other and they were dropping files back and forth between computers unrestricted, which is didn't make any sense at all from a security standpoint. So your process should not allow that. So build processes that are secure. Uh, process might be um, you know, having your employees uh, not logging in remotely out of the office at certain times a day, things like that. And you've got policy. That's where you've actually written down all your processes and procedures and you, and you have them in a policy handbook. And it determines how employees can operate within your organization in a secure way. And then lastly is hardware and software. And again, most people think hardware and software, we're going to hire an IT company. My internal IT staff is going to handle all this. They're going to throw hardware and software at the problem. They typically miss the people process and policy part because that's not what they think about. They're, they're technology guys. They think hardware and software. But if you can get people process and policy right, you'll save money on hardware and software. That's where we go back to that uh, cost, that delicate balance of cost. You can do a whole lot of security before you start spending money. And I've seen companies that do a whole lot of security, don't buy hardly any security suites and never have any problems. Now, there are still things you need to do, and I, but I've seen these companies that don't do those and they're still, they're still doing well. But I do think that they're taking a great risk not having some security measures in place because it just takes that one employee to do something and, and, or, or that one time that someone makes mistakes and clicks on something they shouldn't have. I'll give you an example. Uh, years ago, I worked for a company called Williams Energy. And, I clicked on a, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, I, I went to a website and I meant to go to my email account called Hotmail, H-O-T-M-A-I-L. And I was doing something else and I just typed it and just without even thinking, I typed H-O-T-M-A-L-E. Well, that was pretty embarrassing because there was a lot of pop-ups on my screen. I was trying to close them. I just pushed the computer over and unplugged it, had to, had to call the IT department and tell them what had happened. And, you know, they were like, oh yeah, sure. You didn't mean to go there. So <laughs> anyway, so you need to protect your employees from those types of attacks uh, by putting some hardware and software security in place. All right. So survivability and productivity are determined by people, process, and policy and your hardware and software that you put in place. So there's if you can get the people to understand how security works and to implement it, you put the processes in place, you write the policy so you can hold the people accountable to the processes you put in place, and then you put a the correct appropriate amount of hardware and software security in place as well. Okay, so people, training, testing, accountability. I talked about this already. Um, I kind of jumped ahead. So train your people on what phishing looks like, test them by sending them phishing emails uh, and other testing that you can do, and then just hold them accountable. It might be a positive accountability, it might be a stick. Eventually, if you have an employee who's never catching fish but clicks on every single one, you're gonna to have to deal with that employee. Um, you can't just say, oh, well, it happens to everyone. The truth is viruses don't happen to people who don't make mistakes. Now that mistake could be as simple as going to a website that you thought was hot mail and it turned out to be hot M-A-L-E, uh, but people make mistakes. And when they make mistakes, that does cost your organization money. So uh, get your people trained, test them and hold them accountable for the mistakes they do make. And you know, be reasonable, people do make mistakes. Even your IT guys make mistakes. Okay, your process. So your hiring, termination, transfers, uh, things like that are really important to have a process. And I'll give you a reason why that's so important. Uh, specifically, let's talk about termination. You have an employee that works for your organization and uh, for whatever reason they didn't work out, let's just say that they were lazy. They, they were lazy, they weren't doing their work, so you had to let them go. Well, if your employee is on the wireless network in your office and the wireless network uses a static SSID and web key, then now that he blessed your office, they can go sit in your parking lot after hours when no one's there, get on your wireless network and try to attack your, your network. So create processes for hiring, termination, and transfers that disable access for employees as they're terminated. That's really, really important. Same with logins and passwords. An employee leaves, it's not enough to just you know, hire a new employee, create a new account. If that old account's out there and not disabled, that old employee still may have access even from outside the network. So have a process for that. 
Also, when we talk about uh, healthcare specifically, we're talking about um, a minimum necessary rule. That means that your employees should not have more access to data than what's necessary for, their or for them in your organization. So let's say you have someone who is a receptionist um, and they also, uh, or they get promoted and now they're in a different area. Well, as a receptionist, they may have access to medical records. And is that when they got promoted, now they don't have access to medical records because they're doing something that doesn't it reply, require them to do things in medical records. You need to change their permissions based on where they're at in, in the, the organization as well. And you should have a process for doing that. All right, I think I hammered that one too hard. All right, so let's talk about policy. You need an employee handbook. Every, almost every company has one these days. Um, all the different payroll companies will give you a cookie cutter one. Um, that's how we started. I got a cookie cutter one from ADP and I kind of worked through it and, and polished it up and then sent it to an attorney to, to write it all up and, and make all my changes. Um, but have a good employee handbook, review it at least annually to make sure that it still matches the way you, the way you operate. Now, it's not enough to have just an employee handbook. You need to have, uh, well, it is enough if you have all these documents in there. You know, you have your employee handbook, vacation time, how all that stuff works, uh, what your disciplinary, uh, way you do discipline in your organization, but also have in there uh, how people are allowed to use technology uh, when they're out of the office, what your expectations on any devices owned by the organization and so on. Uh, and there's a really good company uh, online called the Sands Institute that has a lot of really good uh, cookie cutter ones that you can go in and kind of look at to give you an idea of what you should be doing. And that's uh, Sands Institute, S-A-N-S Institute. If you Google that, you'll find it. Don't, don't just take the cookie cutter ones. Give them to an attorney. Make sure that what you're doing is legal because sometimes there's things on there where they don't apply or you can't do that uh, you know, in certain states with regulations and federal regulations. So so keep that in mind, but have an attorney go through that. It's not usually that expensive to have done. Um, risk assessments. Uh, we talk about risk assessments when it comes to HIPAA compliance all the time, but every organization needs a risk assessment. Uh, we perform them for our clients periodically. Where we go through and just make sure that there's nothing we're missing because from the day-to-day -day of supporting our clients, we may miss something. So we'll do a scan on their network once a quarter, look at everything that's going on in the environment to see if we're missing anything and then we'll make adjustments. So good example of that would be if an employee got terminated, but we weren't notified, uh, we'll do a risk assessment, uh, say once a quarter, like I said, and then um, we'll do a scan and that'll look and see, oh, hey, Joe has not logged into the system for 90 days. Well, we reach out to the client and say, hey, Joe hasn't logged into the system in 90 days. Is he still work there? Oh no, we terminated him. Oh, okay, well next time, please let us know because he's had access for 90 days. So do, do periodic risk assessments. We're big fans of doing a light risk assessment once a quarter and then a heavy risk assessment once a year. And by risk assessment, we're talking about the technology side of looking at your infrastructure, but you need to go beyond that. You know, you can do risk assessments and everything in your organization. Just think of it like a, a fire drill. You know, you need to go in and do fire drills periodically to make sure that everyone knows how to get out of the building in a fire. Same thing with risk assessments. Recurring policy reviews. Look at your policies, your policy handbook that needs to be on a schedule, work through it. Uh, and do that on a consistent basis. All right, this is what we're trying to avoid. Like I talked about before, we talk about forensics, we're talking about uh, recovery from ransomware, we don't have any data to go by. So we don't have the chalk outline of the person laying on the ground. So we don't want you to get ransomware to begin with because recovery is very difficult. That's why so many people pay the ransom. We want to avoid ransomware at all costs, but if by chance you get ransomware, we want to have you as recoverable as possible. And there's several ways to do that. One of the biggest ways to do that is through log aggregation, where we can have all your logs stored offsite. So if you get ransom, we can go through those logs, figure out where the attacker came in and how to root them out of your backup so we can recover your environment to your most recent backup. All right. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through these pretty quick because I've been talking too much and I'm gonna run us out of time if I'm not careful. This is where we get into the hardware and software. Like I said, this is the last thing that you look at. So, so we're gonna talk about endpoint detection response. EDR is like an antivirus on steroids. Uh, it has some rollback functionality. If you get ransomware or another attack, it should freeze it. It talks to all the other endpoints and it tells them, do not communicate with this computer that is on the network that's trying to spread. It will try to isolate the attack and uh, it's, it's really powerful. It's a little expensive. Uh, it's got a lot of artificial intelligence in how it operates. And anytime you say the word AI, software gets really expensive. Uh, security incident event management system. Again, this is another one that's, this is the most expensive security solution that we can put in place for our clients but it takes all the logs of everything going on in the network, stores them in the cloud so we can then recover your environment. It's a very big tool for recovery, but it also does some threat hunting. 
and will look for threats across the network. But it will aggregate all the logs for everything on your network, servers, workstations, firewalls, uh, access points, switches, you name it, so that I can, and it uses AI also, so it can correlate. When an attack happens, we can narrow it down to the original attack vector and root out every instance of it in your network. Uh, it's pretty powerful stuff. Uh, Multi-factor authentication. You know, the day has come and gone where this is just something that's an option. It, it's really not an option anymore. We're seeing insurance brokers, uh, as a matter of fact, the EDR and the SIM I just mentioned, uh, insurance brokers are starting to require this. And if you don't do them, your rates are going to be higher. Uh, we've also seen this from um, lending institutions. If you want to get a loan or refinance a loan for your business, they're starting to require this because they don't want the liability of you going out of business uh, from ransomware, which is what happens a lot of the time. Okay, privileged access, well, multi-factor authentication, that's again, I talked about it earlier. Uh, you have your login and password you're used to, but now you have a second form of authentication. Uh, if you can call it 2FA, 2FA or MFA, you know, second form of authentication or multi-factor authentication. And you have that second form of authentication that has like a six digit number that changes every minute. Makes it incredibly hard for someone to compromise your login and password from outside the network. Privileged access management, um, before privileged access management came around, there was two options really to secure your desktop computers. That was to, uh, well, one option really, and that was to not give anyone administrative rights in their computer. And anytime they wanted to install anything or do something on their computer, they had to call IT. IT would go in and do it for them. Um, that's really painful. So a company invented privileged access management that allows us to go in and whitelist certain things on your computer, like let's say Zoom. If you use Zoom, like what we're using right now, you know, it has an update that comes out about once every four hours. It seems like it's all the time. Well, you wouldn't be able to install those updates unless you were a local administrator. We don't want you to be a local administrator because when you're a local administrator on your computer and you go to a website on accident and that website tries to run an, a malicious payload on your computer, it's going to be able to do it as an administrator. So we don't want you to be an administrator, but we do want to allow you to do the things you need to do in your business. So we go in and we whitelist certain applications, certain things that you want to do. And if you come across something that you want to do that it won't allow you to do, we're going to, it's going to prompt us or someone within your organization to authorize that. What's great about that is we'll sometimes get a prompt where a, uh, a customer of ours had, had not tried to install anything, but something on their computer that they went to a website or something tried to install something and it prompted us. And we're like, oh, that's bad. And we'll deny it because we know what, how to identify those things. So privileged access management is very valuable. Advanced threat protection, um, that is, uh, Microsoft kind of coined the phrase advanced threat protection. I'm always surprised that they were able to do that uh, before anyone else. Uh, basically, if you remember spam filtering, that's what advanced threat protection is. It's just, it's gotten a lot smarter than it used to be. Used to be, it would just try to block emails from spam sending sources. That was the original purpose of spam filtering. Well, now it actually is about blocking malicious attacks. So when someone sends you a, a malicious website URL and email, it will rewrite that URL so that when you, if you do click on it, it goes to the threat protection company and they analyze it to look to see if there's something malicious happening. And I had this happen the other day. I had one come in in the sandbox. I tested it and sure enough, our, our software blocked it. It was really cool. Um, and then the other thing that it'll do is it will filter attachments. So what it does with an attachment, so someone sends you a zip file, and it could be someone that you do business with all the time, uh, but their email was compromised, and they send you a zip file, and you open that zip file, and that zip file kicks off a whole bunch of things on your computer. Well, what happens whenever someone sends you a zip file, it gets what they call detonated. So the uh, advanced threat protection company that you're using will detonate that in a sandbox on their end to see what it tries to do. Does it try to launch something? Does it try to, to make scripts happen? What is it going to try to do? And if it tries to do anything at all, it's not going to allow it through. You're going to get notified that, hey, this looks like a threat. And you can go whitelist it later if you think it wasn't a threat, uh, or your administrator can, that is. But it's going to block it from coming through to you. It's a great protection since email is one of the first ways that people get in. And then employees making bad decisions on emails is the second way. Um, let's, uh, let's protect those as best we can. And that's what advanced threat protection does. A subscription-based firewall router. This is one that it's, it's typically, it's a little hard to explain, um, but think about your antivirus. If you bought an antivirus today and you put it on your computer and you never renewed it, it's only got the definitions that are on there from the day you bought it. You know, as soon as those, that one year license was up, you're not gonna get any more definitions. So you're not gonna be protected from the latest threats. It's the same thing with your firewalls. Firewalls are now really called advanced security appliances. Don't even think of them like firewalls because when you think firewall, oh, I've got one at home. It's this blue and black uh, Linksys firewall I've had for years. 
Well, they don't do anything. All they do is say, if you try to knock on the door, I'm not going to let you in. But if someone on the other side of the door wants to let you in, I'm going to let you in. So in your business, you don't want to allow that. You want a firewall that's smart and does some really advanced things like content filtering, where it blocks malicious, no malicious websites. Uh, it does antivirus on the firewall. So if a virus gets in your network, it doesn't allow it to communicate out and it tries to block them from getting in to begin with. And then it does uh, intrusion protection, intrusion, de um, intrusion detection, intrusion prevention. So it looks for attacks trying to get into your systems and then blocks those actively. And uh, lastly, it'll do geo IP. So IP addresses like your home address, uh, that's where people can go find your house. Well, they can come find your business through your IP address. Well, that's fine, except for you don't want people coming from IPs outside the country. If you don't do business in Russia, North Korea, Ukraine, if you don't do business in those countries, let's block all those IP addresses from being able to get in. Now, there's ways that attackers can work around that, and they often do, but let's block the easy ones at least, get the low-hanging fruit out of the way. All right, um, system patch management. You need to patch all your workstations and servers all the time because an unpatched workstation is something that everyone knows to attack. For instance, if there's a known vulnerability on your Windows 10 computer and you go to a malicious website, it may be something on that website that tries to use that vulnerability on your browser, your computer, or what have you to install a payload. Uh, so you need to keep them up to date, and that includes your Windows operating system and any applications installed on your operating system. Um, backup disaster recovery, BDR, you need to have good backup. Backups, there's some rules about backups. Number one, you need to have backups that are on site so you can do quick recoveries. If something gets like a file gets uh, lost or, or whatever happens to it, we can do a quick recovery. You need offsite backup. You need to encrypt your backups both at rest on site, at rest off site, and you do need to encrypt them in transit. They need to have sec uh, separate authentication mechanisms at both locations. Uh, and you need to just, just monitor that and restore your backups at least once a quarter, if not once a month, to make sure that they work. It's not enough on your backups to allow the software to say you have a good backup. You have to actually restore into a sandbox, bring that machine up, look at the login screen, log in, make sure things work, log out, destroy that instance, and continue your backups. We've seen too many times where backups will say success, but when you actually have a disaster, it wasn't a success. The backup software was not doing a good job validating the backups. So test your backups at least quarterly. Mobile device management, if you have mobile devices that your organization owns, a mobile device management software will allow you to restrict what employees can do on those phones. And I'm going to tell you why that's so important. Let's say you've got employees that use iPads and they take them home. They go to church, they hand the iPad to their kids so their kid can install every app under the sun without any vetting process whatsoever. Those apps then are granted access to the pictures on the iPad. To you, You've seen it. When you install apps in your phone, it says, do you want to give all these rights? Well, when the kid says yes to that and it's a malicious app, now they have access to your email. They may have access to all the pictures. Let's say you're a doctor and you've got x-rays that you've taken pictures with your iPad because you do work on it. Bad, bad news. Don't, don't allow that. So with a mobile device management system, you can say these are the apps that can be installed on our company-owned devices like iPhones, iPads, Android phones, Android tablets. Um, and you can restrict that. And then you can give them a list of apps that they can install, which makes it easy for them to configure their iPad for work. They can still do certain things like go to the internet and do things that they want to do on it, but you can restrict a lot of things on there and you can monitor a lot of things going on on there. Mobile devices are a very, very dangerous way to lose electronic protected health information and PII. Um, so third-party risk assessment, again, make sure to do a scan. If you hire a company to do a third-party risk assessment, don't count on them just to come out with a checklist. A lot of these companies will come out, they'll give you a checklist or they'll sit with you and they'll ask you a bunch of questions or they'll go to your IT department and ask them a bunch of questions. Do not rely on people saying what they're doing. Go and have someone do a risk assessment that looks at what's going on. They may come back and say, hey, your IT department's doing great. I've, had, I've done that one time on one assessment since I've been in business. The company in, in, in Edmond and the guy who ran the shop was rock solid. He was a he was a rock star. I wish I could have hired him, but I couldn't do that to the client. So, but he had that place locked down, tight as a drum. I was so impressed. Um, but but I did a scan. He let me. He had to he had to remove some restrictions to allow my scan to run because he had it so well locked down. I did my scan. I sat down with him and I'm like, you guys are the only company I've ever been to that's done a great job and everything's really secure. So. They were really thrilled to hear that. Uh, they invited me back every year since to do more scans, <laughs> just to tell them how great they are. So, uh, so do a scan. All right, so that's hardware and software. 
Okay, so recovery, deploy all the tools in the previous slide. Well, you don't really have to do that. You know, we, we need to come up with a solution that fits your budget. Uh, you have to decide what the risk is. And I'll educate, you know, for my clients, I'm going to educate them on what each one of these tools do, like I've already done, but I would go into more detail. And if you said you don't want it, I may, I may try to come back and say, are you sure? Because let's talk about all these other things. But I understand that you have a budget you need to work within. And, and but my job is to try to convince you to do these things. Your job is to determine what your organization can afford and what your risk is. OK, so deploy all the tools in the previous slide. Again, you don't have to do that. You can pay the ransom. So let's say you got ransomware. You're going to pay the ransom. Now, one of the things I want to say is this is recovery. So I kind of jumped uh, sideways here. But when I say deploy all the tools in the previous slide, what I meant to say on here is if you get ransomware, the company that comes out to recover you, the first thing you're going to do is deploy every tool that I just told you about on your environment to be able to lock it down and start the recovery process. Having those tools in advance will prevent you probably from getting ransomware. And if you do get it, it's going to make you much more recoverable. That's why they deploy all those tools I just listed if you get a ransomware incident. Okay, so you can pay the ransom. You can redeploy your environment from scratch. That's wiping everything out. Uh, recover from backups. Oftentimes, it's not possible because the attackers want to wipe your backups out before they kick off the ransom. They almost always do that. You can sell your company to a competitor or a larger provider. Uh, you can just excuse me, you can close your doors forever. Um, I mean, these are really your options. Now, when I say redeploy your environment from scratch, just know paying the ransom is not enough. If, if you get ransomware, you have to assume that every computer is compromised. You're going to wipe out, even if you spend the millions of dollars or whatever it costs to buy the keys, you're going to wipe out everything in your environment after you decrypt it. Then you're going to rebuild everything in your environment from scratch. If we're talking about a ERP system, a uh, medical record system, People spend hundreds of thousands and even millions of dollars to get those systems implemented. Imagine having to pay to have it more or less re-implemented again, and then nothing's going to be where it was before when you're done. It's not like you pay the ransom and you're back in business. That's not how it goes. I did an uh, interview with um, Alan, uh, Alan Loveless with uh, uh, Stillwater um, Regional Hospital, and they had a ransomware incident. It was in the news, so it's not something I'm telling you I shouldn't be. Um, but when I talked to Alan, he said that the, um, the one thing that really surprised him is once they paid the ransom and everything's back up now, or it's mostly back up, nothing's where it once was. People can't find things. Things are running slower. They're having to figure things out again, rebuilding a lot of infrastructure. It's, you can't just flip the switch and be back in business. It's a mess. All right. And again, we want to avoid um, all this. We just don't want a whole lot of dead bodies laying out there. We want to help protect the clients. We want the clients to protect themselves. We want to make good business decisions. Then I want to just touch on this real quick. On, on average, the Afghanistan war cost over 20 years about $100 billion per year. In 2021, the cost of ransomware to businesses was $20 billion. They're estimating to be over $100 billion in the next 10 years, and there's no sign of it easing up at present. Um, so just to put that in perspective, now I doubt that the Afghanistan war cost $100 billion in the last 10 years or so, but that was the average over 20 years. And this is not political. Please don't think that I'm trying to be political. I'm just saying that we're in a war right now with attackers and it's it's organized crime. It's other nations. And that war cost as much as a, almost as much as a real war. And it will as it keeps heating up until organizations start locking their environment down. And we all have to accept the, there's an increased cost to doing IT than there used to be so much as just five years ago. We're seeing it can be as much as double what you're used to paying as of five years ago. Uh, just depends on, like I said, let's figure out that risk. You need to figure out your risk, what you're willing to uh, take risk on, and then make a decision to move forward. All right, that's all I've got. So um, I made it. We got a little bit of time here. Jeff, do you want to take some questions? Absolutely, Brian. Thank you for today's educational session. And thank you to the audience for joining us today. As Brian said, we're happy to take any questions you might have. Just please use the chat option or the Q&A uh, option at the bottom. Um, or if you think about it later on, feel free to just email us there. You've got Brian Largent's email address right there on the slide in front of you. Um, and, uh, and Brian, we've got just a couple more poll questions. If you want to go ahead and just put those up on the screen yeah. for our audience today while they are looking things over. Um, I don't see any questions at this point, uh, so I'll move forward. Uh, so I mentioned at the first, we were going to give away a $25 gift card to one of our attendees today. And uh, the winner today is 
Barbara Allman. So Barbara, I will be uh, following up with you, probably, uh, reach out to you and make sure I get that sent to you. Um, yeah, we got a couple of poll questions. If our audience will, as, they're, as we're wrapping up, if you'll please uh, complete that. And uh, Ben and Brian and I will stay on for a few more minutes on this um, uh, Zoom call in case you have any other questions or just want to visit with us. Uh, thank yeah, you thank again. Do you guys have any questions, the things I didn't cover, we could, we could cover? I think that was wow. pretty intuitive. I think uh, answer all the detailed. questions forever. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, very comprehensive, very thought provoking. Lots of things to consider for any organization uh, and any any leader. Um, but as always, uh, you know, I'm sure there are a few questions out there, and we'll. I said we'll not wait. to be driven by fear, but driven by facts. You know, it's just a. It's a, it's a matter of, of being educated and uh, making those educated decisions for the environment. And I, I think you're making a really, really good point, Vin. And that's, that's, you know, we work with vendors all the time. And the typical vendor tactic these days is to sell on fear. It's like, oh, if you don't buy our product, you know, it, you're going you're gonna to get ransomware. You're going to have all these problems. You know, you may get ransomware, but there's layers of security. There's ways to do this. Uh, so that you have recoverability and limited downtime if you get ransomware. So you really just need to weigh, do I want to stop it at all costs? Do I, do I want to, to stop it at all costs? Do I want to be recoverable? You know, there, there's layers and ways to go after this that are uh, intelligent and not as expensive as buying every single tool in the tool chest. But again, you need to have someone that you trust that will partner with you, kind of walk you through the process and, and, and go through all the different solutions in a, in a reasonable way, not a fear-driven way. I hate fear-driven sales. It's one of the reasons I struggle with, with even doing these webinars because it's doom and gloom. And I would rather it just be, we're gonna make your life better, not charge you a bunch of money to keep your life from being worse. And it's a hard spot to be in. And I think that turns a lot of people off to cybersecurity because they feel like, oh, well, you know, you're a snake oil salesman. You're just, you're just trying to scare people. We're genuinely scared by this. Um, we do think our clients should be concerned but, but don't be driven by fear, be driven by the facts, make good risk assessments. And then if it happens, you're going to have recoverability no matter what. So, so good point, Vin. Yeah, excellent point. And providing good education to our communities is so important, partic particularly on this type of topic. So thank you again. I, I don't see any other questions at this point. Um, so if, uh, Brian or Ben, either of you have anything else before we conclude today? No, that's all I had. Okay, we're good. Thank, thank you so much. Thanks so much to our audience, and uh, may the rest of your day.